John chapter 1, verse 12 says, But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. I want to read that one more time. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Let's talk about this for a little bit this morning. Let's pray and ask God to bless this time. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your presence here today. Thank you that when we open up our hearts and, and lift up our voices, Lord, your presence, your anointing, your spirit fills the very atmosphere, God, where your praise fills the room. And we thank you for meeting here with us today already in a supernatural and powerful way, touching our hearts, bringing, bringing some of us home to you in a fresh relationship with you, God. We thank you for all of that that's taking place, and we thank you for what's about to take place even further as we get into your word today. Lord, I ask you to speak to us. Let your voice pierce our hearts. Let your spirit refresh our souls, and let us, let us see and hear you clearly today, Father. Bless every dollar that's given in faith, God. Every seed that's sown, Father God, in obedience, every tithe that's offered, Father. We thank you that, Lord, when we are faithful with the tithe, your word promises that you will stand up in heaven, rebuke the devourer from our lives, and open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that we cannot contain. And, God, we receive the promise of your word as we put it into action in our lives this morning by supporting your kingdom, your work in this local house. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody said amen. And hey, one more time. Oh, we got to do this. I almost forgot. Put your hand on your belly somewhere at home in the building right now. As I ask God to speak to us personally today. Repeat this after me. Say, Jesus, speak to me today. Open up my eyes. Open up my ears. Let me see what you want me to see. Let me hear what you want me to hear so I can do what you want me to do and be everything you've called me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, when I was a kid growing up in Owensboro, Kentucky, I had the most amazing barber, I think, that uh, has ever existed. Uh, and the reason I say it is because every time I went in, uh, you know, from the ages of whatever I can remember to, you know, 9, 10, 11 years old, he would ask me, what kind of haircut do you want today? And depending on the mood of the week or what movies or TV shows I may have just watched, I would answer usually with one of two questions. And my dad is in the back. He will verify this information. I would answer with one of two questions. I would say either today I would like a policeman's haircut. And I would get a flat top and a mustache. <laughs> And then the next time, I might say I would like a fireman's haircut. And I would get a flat top and a mustache. <laughs> and, uh, amazing. He was able to do any haircut of profession that I asked for uh, as long as it was a flat top with a mustache, apparently. Uh, and so, and so it, but he was, he was asking the question that we ask ourselves and we ask our children and, and that we have to think about, and it, and it is this question of what do you want to be when you grow up, right? What do you want to be when you grow up? Or, or here's the thing about that question. Typically when we're younger, and, and, and for some of us even into our much older years, when we ask, and we may even ask it this way, either way we ask it, we're answering mostly the same question. We're really not asking what do you want to be when you grow up, and usually we're answering with not what I want to be, but more what I want to do, right? What do you want to be when you grow up? And I answer with an occupation as a child, a fireman, a policeman. I want to be, really I'm just saying this is what I want to do with my life. This is the occupation that I want to have. This is the activity that I, amen? Amen. And sometimes we even ask it that way. What do you want to do with your life? What do you want to do with yourself? What do you want to do when you become an adult? What do you want to do to earn a living? What do you want to do to make money? What do you want to do? And, and it's all these questions of what I do. And what I want to do, listen, is a very important question that has to be answered at some point in our life. But here's the problem. And this is something that I'm realizing later in my life over the last few years as I've gotten a little older 
hopefully a little bit wiser, is that what I want to do is not nearly as good a question as what do I want to become. Amen? Because I can have a very clear picture and idea of what, leave that up there for a minute for me until I tell you to take it down. I can have a very clear picture of what it is that I want to do with my life. I want to get this job. I want to, I want to do medicine. I want to be a doctor. I want, to, I want to do police work. I want to be a fireman. I want to be in the armed services. I want to be a teacher. But that's all really just occupational things, Right? That all answers the question, what am I going to do with my life? What am I going to do with the hours that I'm, so what am I going to do to make money? And here's the thing. I can get the job. I can get the promotion. I can get the title. I can get the degree. I can get all the certifications that allow me to do what I want to do. However, I can do that thing and still not actually become what God wants me to be. Amen? So I think we need to go back sometimes and we need to understand that who do I want to become is a much better question than what do I want to do. Okay? Because what I do will follow or be informed by what I become. Amen? So I just want to ask us that question today. As, as mostly adults or, or older teens and, and high schoolers and in this room, I want to ask us, I want to just throw that question into our hearts, into our ears, into our spirits this morning. What do you, or rather, who, who do you want to become? That's a question I find myself asking in my, in my early 40s here in this stage of life I'm in. Justin, who are you becoming? Who do you want to become? Who do you want to be remembered as? Do you simply want to just be known as a guy who could get up on stage, talk into a microphone, and crack a few jokes, and share some, share some ideas from Scripture? I mean, that has its place, and that has some value, I suppose. Or, or do you want to be more than that? Is there more than that that God has called you to become? Who, Justin, do you want to be? That's a much better, much deeper sometimes much tougher question to answer than just what do I want to do? Who do I want to become is a better question to ask than what do I want to do? And in this text in John chapter 1, the apostle John answers that question for us through the life of Jesus. Jesus answers the question for the believer. Here's what he said. John 1, 12, we just read it a minute ago. He said, all who believed him and accepted him, watch this, he gave the right to become a child of God. So here's what we see through Scripture and through, and through Christ. Watch this. What I believe determines what or who I become. You can take that down. What I believe will determine who I become. And who I become will determine what it is that I do. And Jesus has told us that when we believe in him, some of you just raised your hand, some of you have been a believer in Christ for a very long time. Some of you at home have been, have been a part of uh, Christianity and served for a very long time. You've believed for a long time. You've been on your way to heaven for a very long time or maybe for the first time in these last few moments. It doesn't matter. If you believe, you are becoming a child of God. That's it. And so the question becomes, okay, that's what I'm becoming. That's what I am to become. That's how I am to live my life. That's who I am to be, a child of God. And everything that that means, everything that goes with it. Then the question becomes, okay, what does a child of God do? Because Jesus has already given me the answer, who I become. Because belief determines what I become. Amen? Belief affects what I become. And here's the thing. (laughs) Here's the thing. Something is off. Something is off 
if what I believe has no effect on what I become. Amen? If what I believe doesn't determine and influence and directly affect who I become, something's amiss, something's awry. I'm missing something somewhere. Something's not connecting, okay? Either the belief is faulty or (laughs) I don't really believe. Amen? But if what I believe is correct, and if who I believe in, and if I actually believe that, that is going to determine who I believe so, or, or what I become. So I've got to ask myself, do, if, do I really believe, or do I really live or apply those beliefs to my life, okay? Famous comedian, some of you may have heard of him, Louis C.K., had the best insight that I've ever heard, better than any preacher about this, to be honest with you. <laughs> A few years ago in a stand-up special, he made this point. He said, I have all of these beliefs and live by none of them. <laughs> okay. He said, he, he, he gave the illustration, he said, I was on a plane one time, and the plane was crowded. He said, I saw a soldier, a soldier in full uniform going home from wherever he was stationed at, coming on the plane. And he, and he said, I was there in my first class seat, and I thought, man, I thought, man, it would be, I should get up and give my first class seat to this soldier. He said, and just thinking that thought made me feel like a better person. And I just sat there in my first class seat, proud of myself for thinking the thought, right? And that's maybe an extreme example, but how many of us can start going and say, well, we would say, well, do you believe this? Do you believe that? We may say yes, we may say no, and we may say we have all these beliefs, but really belief that doesn't affect what I do and belief that doesn't really affect who I become doesn't really, is that really belief? Or is that really worth something to believe in if it has no real influence? Amen, somebody? But Jesus clearly says here, the word of God clearly says, if you believe in Jesus, you become a child of God. So belief opens the door to who I, to who, to who I become. Is that, I, was, I couldn't hear if that sounded right in my head or not. Okay? Belief opens the door to who I'm going to become. But belief just opens or Notice this. Jesus Jesus does not say, the word of God does not say here that he who believes is a child of God. It says he who believes has the right, watch this, to become a child of God. Okay? Now I'm going to throw all of your very cute hold hold hands and sing we are the world uh, theology out the window here real quick. And some of you are going to get very upset and very mad at me. But listen to me very closely now. I know that we have been told, and it's very wonderful to think about, that we are all God's children. Oh, every, we're all God's children. And there is, in a sense, that is, in a sense, there is a sense of that that is true. But this actually, and, and, and if you look at the whole of the New Testament, the whole Scripture, you'll see that, to be honest, we are not, we don't even have the, this says that I don't even have the right to become a child of God, much less be a child of God, until I first accept Jesus as my Savior. Now, ev- that is available to everyone and anyone who has ever drawn breath on planet Earth. In fact, I'll make you real mad here. Paul would later write in the New Testament, he will write in letters, he will tell people, uh, until you're saved, you are a child of the devil. <laughs> Why? Because I'm under sin doesn't mean God doesn't love you, but, and it doesn't mean that there's not a way that's been made for me to become a child of God. There is. That way is Jesus. Amen, somebody? But notice that belief doesn't necessarily just automatically make me a child of God. It does change my position from sinner to saint, changes my position from, from on my way to hell to on my way to heaven. It does position, but in the way that I live my life and in my ability to experience and become a child of God, I don't just automatically wake up doing that. No, but I do have, the Bible says, Jesus said, the right to become a child of God. That lets me know that there's going to be some stuff and there's going to be some steps, there's going to be some growing and some learning and some doing in between the time that I believe and the time that I become. Amen? 
Are you following me so far? Belief opens the door to what I become, and so what I've got to do is I've got to figure out how do I become that child of God because that is God's will. This word is the will of God for my life. All right, let's try that again. I want to make sure everybody gets that and understands that. This word is the will of God for your life. And this word says that you believe and then you become. Yes? Okay. So then, if I have not yet quite become that, but that is what I am becoming and that is what I am to become, how do I become that? How does, my, how does what I now believe turn me into what I'm supposed to become? How do I do that? How, let me say it this way. How do I then claim that right? How do I claim the right that my belief has given me access to, to become what Jesus wants me to be, a child of God, a son of God, a daughter of God? Does anyone know? Good. That's why I'm here, okay? Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> let's, let's, let's learn together. Let's look at it together. I got some ideas. There's, there's, we can talk about this. Honestly, everything that we do in church, everything we do in discipleship, everything, literally everything that we do is, it should be, if we're doing it correctly and according to Scripture, it's all about, every message is about, every word of God is about how do I become a child of God? How do I live what I believe? How do I become what I believe? How does my belief lead me to what I'm supposed to become, right? But here's where it starts. I, this is where a good place to start. How do I become? I'm going to read the 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It should be on the screen. If not, you'll just have to listen. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Where am I at here? Oh, sorry. Is it on? Okay, good. It says, so all of us, all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect, can see and reflect, can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. Leave that up for a second. Children reflect the image of their parents. Yes? Okay. You can look, you can, you, if you have seen my sons, you don't have to look very, I mean, there's no way I could deny that Micah and Luca are my, are my son. I mean, they look the spitting image. And if you see baby pictures of me as a kid, you're going to say, man, that is exactly, you know, and you know what's also weird? They also, baby pictures, they look exactly like their mom. They have ones that, it's very strange. We reflect, it's very, I don't know how it happens, but we reflect the image of the DNA that's been embedded in us, right? Likewise, spiritually, we are to see Jesus, believe in him, and then we reflect what it is that we see. It says the Lord who is the Spirit makes, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Whose image are we changed into? Whose image are we changed into? Yes, his. When we talk about what do I want to become and who am I supposed to become and what, what, does, what does me becoming a child of God look like in my everyday life and in my beliefs, listen to me, we can never forget this guiding principle that I see and I reflect his glory and that I'm transformed more and more like him into his image. Never forget this, okay? This is just kind of an aside that I feel necessary to put in here. It's, 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 it's a side mission. It's, it's, we're going to just a little trail here. Listen to me close. Listen to me close. Don't ever make the mistake of trying to shape the word of God or God's image into yours. Amen? Because that happens far too often. Far too often, I believe Jesus, and I have all of these ideas, and I have all of these other beliefs, and I have all of these other thoughts, and I have all of these other things that culture has told me, and that I've grown up with, and that tradition says, and that religion says, and that the internet says, and that this says, and that says, and my favorite news guy says, and my favorite actor says, or whatever things influence us to, to determine our core and inner beliefs. Some of them good, some of them bad. I'm not knocking any of them. What I'm saying is that none of those outside sources can I bring to God's word and into my pursuit of his image because what often will happen is I, when I do that, I will bring all those things and I end up trying to shape God into my image rather than me being shaped into his. 
Amen, somebody? And I know that this is like a, not a very shouty, even though I'm getting kind of loud. There's not a lot of shouting and amen, and we're not going to be running around the, 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 the church here on this one. And I know that some of this may even sound a little like, you know, oh, this is like some, it's like some new age, you know, some hippie, whatever. Oh, what are we all going to, hey, what am I going to be, man? You know, like, hey, I get it. I get it. I know, I know it kind of can sound like that. <clears throat> but when we, and, and a lot of times, listen, when we begin to ask these questions and when we begin to answer these questions, we can start out good and we can start out with a pure heart and a pure spirit. But if we're not careful, and if we don't go into it with our eyes open, and we don't keep, put that back up there, St. Corinthians 3, 18, please. If we don't keep this as the principle, this is, this is how we do it, okay? This is how, how we change, how we transform into a child of God. We see and we reflect his glory. He is not here to reflect my glory, and I am not here to change him into my image. He, come on, somebody. I am here to be changed into his, okay? Okay? Keep that up there for a second. This is the last thing I want to say about this. If the Jesus that I know never corrects, challenges, or disagrees with what I already thought when I came into the kingdom, there's a real good chance that I'm shaping Jesus into my own image. If every time I come away from reading the Word of God, all of, my, all of my cultural ideologies, political inclinations, and thoughts that I already had about life, if they're not changed, challenged, and transformed from time to time, and they are only reinforced, and I come to this book, and I just come away with a bunch of things that I already thought were, th there's a really good chance that I am superimposing my image onto his. Hello? Hello? Because the Jesus that you see in Scripture ticks everybody off. <laughs> Everybody's mad. Sinners are mad. Religious people are mad. Political people are upset. He's, he's tearing the whole thing down from top to bottom and instilling a new kingdom whose foundation is in heaven. Hello, somebody. And the kingdom, listen, <laughs> the kingdom is not going to be satisfied just to be built on top of the stuff that I've already built. This isn't where I put a Jesus crown on top of a foundation and building that I've already been. No, the Father comes in and destroys the whole thing and then rebuilds from scratch. So how do I become a child of God? Well, I'm changed. Transformation takes place as I see and as I reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes me more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Okay, so, so this idea exists here of I will be transformed into whatever I see. Whatever I'm looking at will begin to influence what I become. Amen? You all know this. I joke with my wife all the time about this, and I can tease her now because she can't uh, hit me, right? She's not here. And so uh, she, she's going to just furiously start typing in the comments probably. Um, <laughs> but I tease her about this all the time because, because, man, if we are around anyone with an accent for more than like 45 seconds, she will begin to reflect that accent. It's crazy. It's, a, it's really quite impressive. She just texted me right now. I swear to God. <laughs> we go down south, it's going to not take long. She's going to be talking like a southern belle. We're, we're on the east coast. She's going to be talking like a Jersey housewife. You know, it's, 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 it's really wild. If we're around Hispanic people, she's going to be talking with an accent real quick. It's, it's wild, actually. We, we, we reflect what we see. Amen? We reflect what we see. Okay? So if I want to be, it, it, so the question's already been answered. I 
if I believe in Jesus, I am becoming a child of God. Yes? How do I do that? Oh, I need to start looking at the things of God to begin to reflect that nature. Hello? Skip it down, back to John chapter 1. Skip down one verse to verse 14. Watch what he says here. He says, so the word became human, or most translations, the word became flesh and made his home among us. He's speaking of Jesus. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. Watch this. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Jesus, leave that up there for a minute for me. Jesus was the Word made flesh. Now John said we beheld his glory in the flesh, but that flesh was the living, breathing embodiment of the Word of God. Okay? Everybody with me? Now we do not have Jesus in the flesh to behold that glory at this time. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father. But we do have the Word that became flesh. Are you following me so far? I know this is going to sound so simple, and I've went a long way to get to a very simple thing, but I want you to understand exactly the powerful connection and the nature of what is happening. If I am looking to become what I believe, I have got to see and behold his glory and put him in front of my eyeballs. And I don't have him in the flesh to look at. The only thing that I have to begin that process is this word. Amen, somebody? I can literally, I know, listen, listen. You're right, is, he, is this whole thing about reading the Bible? Yes. <laughs> yes, in a simplified way. In, a very, in the most simple way I'm saying. But I want you to understand, listen, when you get into this word, and the reason I'm so fired up about it is because it is not just reading book. It is not just reading words on a page. It is not just looking at some ancient text that has, of, yes, yes, it's been manipulated and misrepresented and misinterpreted. Of course, all of those things have happened with every document that has ever had any historical impact throughout all of history. Hello? The Constitution gets manipulated and misinterpreted all the time. Nobody talks about not believing that anymore, do they? In fact, some of you believe the Constitution is on equal ground with this word. You're wrong. <laughs> well, I felt you tighten up on that. Family? The Constitution is not the inspired, living, breathing Word of God. Jesus didn't become the Constitution made flesh, for God's sake. He became the Word of God made flesh. Hello, somebody. I'm preaching a lot better than you're shouting right now. <clears throat> Everything can get misinterpreted. And guess what? I've misinterpreted this book. You're going to misinterpret this book. But it's not about just finding a right, educated, uh, um, um, scholarly interpretation of a book. No, my friend, I am looking at this word because this word is the literal glory of God within the truth that is laid out and within the person that I find in this book, I can see the glory of God. And it's by seeing the glory of God that I can be transformed into that image. John said, we beheld his glory, the word made flesh. And it's by beholding that glory that we are transformed. The only option I have is to look at this book and read this book and live this book until it does something to me they beheld Jesus who is the word reading this book is only the beginning because as I read it 
I then begin to see it, and I can hear it, and I know it, and then I begin to obey it. But I'm not just reading, and I'm not just hearing, and I'm not just seeing, and I'm not just obeying some outdated, lame, old text from back in the day. No, I am hearing, knowing, seeing, beholding Jesus. I know I've said this a lot, but I will continue to say it till my dying breath as long as I have a pulpit to preach from. Listen, this book, yes, it has principles and ways to live your life. Yes, it can show you how to, how to organize and how to structure and, and build a firm foundation for a family, for a marriage, for a business, for anything you want to in life. And that is all part of it. But listen, the goal of this book is not just to show me a bunch of rules and regulations or structures or this and that. The goal of this book is to get me to Jesus. And if I read this book and don't get to Jesus, I have drastically missed what this is about. Belief leads to what I become. What I become and what I am to become if I believe in Jesus is a child of God. And the way to become something from where I am to where I'm supposed to be is by beholding the glory of God and reflecting the glory. And the place to do that begins with the word of God. Amen, somebody? But listen, as you begin to know that, let me say, let me start over here. When I come to the Word of God with the question, Jesus, what does a child of God do? Because that becomes my question. If I start with what I do, I just insert some activities that I want to do. If I start with who do I want to become, I answer that first, and then I have then I figure out, okay, well then what does I what do what does what I want to become do, right? And then I do that. You follow me? So what I want to become, we've answered that. That's a child of God. I want to reflect the glory of God and be transformed into his image, okay? So then the question, when I come to the word of God, when I come to my time with God, the question becomes that I'm looking to have answered in every situation, what does a child of God do in this moment? What does a child of God do as a father? What does a child of God do as a wife? What does a child of God do as a business leader? What does a child of God do as whatever occupation? What does a child of God do in whatever situation and circumstance I'm in? Amen. And when I begin to understand when I come to the word, I'm looking for that question to be answered. Guess what happens? Jesus shows up and begins to answer it. And when that's my heart's intent and when that's what I'm seeking, that's the journey I'm on to what I'm becoming. Is this, is this, are you guys getting, are you guys with me on this? Or are you guys like tapped out? <clears throat> when that's the question I'm answering, I will begin to actually live what I believe, and what I believe will begin to actually affect my life. And then, not only will I begin to see Jesus tell me what does a father do, what does a mother do, what does a teacher do, then the question will be, you'll, you'll see this, Jesus will begin to speak to you specifically and personally. And, and then the question gets answered, what do I do? Justin Bradley as a child of God do. And when you begin to allow Jesus through his word and through his spirit to speak to you that way, guess what? You begin to have an actual relationship with your creator. Which is what this whole thing's about. Amen? <clears throat> So, I guess I'm almost done. 
We feel like, okay, where do we go from here? Start getting into this word. And letting that inform. If you believe in Jesus, if you're not, if you're not a Christian, if, you're, if that's not, listen, then do whatever, I don't know, do whatever you want. Read the Constitution, figure that out, I don't know. But if the goal is to become what you believe, and if you actually believe, you've got to start getting into this word. That's why last year we started, I started doing reading plans. And, I, and, I, and that was some great idea. I, I, the Holy Spirit put that in my heart. So I started doing reading plans. You can, if you haven't signed up for a reading plan, text Red Life Bible. You got that slide? Can you find that slide in there somewhere? Is that back in there, Eric, somewhere? Find the Red Life Bible slide if we can find it. Throw that up there. You'll get a text every Monday morning. You, there it is right there. Yeah, you can do that QR code. Sign up for that, man. Every, every Monday morning, a text goes out with five days of scriptures to read, usually that are based on the message that you heard Sunday. And that's just a start. You can go that from wherever you want to. Find a Bible plan. Find a reading plan in version. There's all kinds of tools to help you. That's why reading plans exist. These things exist. Amen? That's why we have growth track to help you learn how to read the Bible. And this is something else we're starting. Listen, starting in February, I'm going to talk about this a little more later. I'm not going to do the whole spiel right now. Starting in February, this is just something the Lord has put on my heart for this year. Um, and I don't know how we'll continue it for as long as, as long as we feel led to. But starting this year on the third Wednesday night of the month, we have first Wednesday prayer and worship. On the third Wednesday night of the month, we're going to have some times of, uh, we're going to have Bible study class. Okay, Bible teaching. Not me preaching and screaming at you. Uh, there may be one or more classes going on at a time that you can choose from. And uh, we're going we're gonna to take some time and get in the Word. Amen, somebody? Because, boy, I think it's just a shame. Because here's the thing. You have the right to become, and positionally, when you get saved, as far as God sees you, yes, you are a child of God. But as far as my life is lived on earth, I have not yet maybe become. I am becoming that. Does that make sense? There's what I am spiritually through my covenant with Jesus or through his covenant with me. But then there's what I am while I'm in between the time where what he has created me to be in heaven comes true and the time I'm here on this earth. Does that make sense? And it would be a daggone shame to live 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years and you are a child of God in heaven yet have never become that in your life in any way, shape, or form. Because we didn't get into the word of God. Amen. And that's the only way it's going to happen. Well, I, I come to church every Sunday. I thought that was enough. Man, I'm so glad you're here. And it is a great start. Amen. And listen, as here's the, the truth, guys. As fantastic and anointed and wonderful and eloquent and all the other things as a preacher as I may be. I'm joking. I, once a week, hearing me tell you what I've seen in the Word is not even close to enough for you to begin to discover who God wants you to be. Amen? I want you to know this Word. I want you to be changed into, and I want you to have the question answered with all of my heart so that you know every day this is what Cody Schuler, as a child of God, is supposed to be. This is what Josh cried. This is what Brittany cried. This is what this is what Katie is supposed. This is as a child of God who I am supposed to become, who Jesus is shaping me into be the part of the of the part of His image that I have been created to reflect. But that starts with getting into the Word, spending time in the Word, spending time with Jesus in the Word, and letting those questions be answered. I know this is like a very basic thing. Some of you are like, yeah, okay, preacher, been there, done that, heard that my whole life, whatever. Well, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14, this is what the Apostle Paul wrote. You know Paul, that guy who started like 
a thousand churches and saw like a million billion people get saved in the first century and cast devils out. And, you know, I mean, th- that guy, Paul, I mean, th- you know, when he couldn't lay hands on somebody to pray for him to be healed, he just took like a rag he was sweating on and threw that on him and they got healed. That guy, that's who we're talking about. Paul, this is what he said. Just to be safe, just to be, just to be clear, has anyone ever wiped sweat off your brow and, and they took you out to the hospital and somebody got up out of the hospital bed that couldn't get out? Okay, so none of us are at Paul's level, I think it's fair to say. Yes? Okay. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, Paul wrote these words. And this is near the end of his life, not the beginning. He says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. In the 15th century, Spain was probably considered the the world's superpower. On Spain's coins, on the back of it, they had an inscription, uh, an image of Hercules pushing over the, the, what was known as the Pillars of Hercules. And an inscription in Latin said, and I'm going to butcher the Latin, like, uh, whatever, but it said, non- plus ultra, non plus ultra, or whatever. I don't know how they said it, right? Non plus ultra, okay? Three three words, three Latin words. And it meant nothing beyond. Nothing beyond. Put that other picture up there, please. And that was to illustrate, this is the Strait of Gibraltar, Spain to the north, Africa to the south. And these two mountain peaks from the Strait of Gibraltar as they passed Spain and empty into the Atlantic Ocean were called the Pillars of Hercules. And in the 15th century, Spain as the world's superpower, they basically had the belief that there was, this was, we have reached the pinnacle of discovery and civilization. There is nothing more beyond our own border. There is nothing more beyond the place that we have secured, the kingdom that we have built. There's nothing except just blue ocean, nothing past that. Nothing beyond. Of course, later in the 15th century, you know the story, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and found out, hey, there's actually some other stuff here. Actually found out there's been a whole lot of people here before we even got here, to be honest. King Charles V, after Columbus and many other expeditions had discovered that there was actually an entirely other continent on the other side of what we thought there was nothing beyond, had the inscription changed from non plu ultra to plu ultra, more beyond. More beyond. The same pillars. Same thing illustrating the end, the end of what we know, the end of what we built, the border of what we've secured. But they now had the understanding that there is so much more, so much more beyond what we've already built. There's so much more that we had no idea of. There's so much more outside of the thing that we're comfortable with, so much more that we can't even really begin to imagine. And it does seem silly, doesn't it? We, you know, a few hundred years later, we're like, well, what, what a silly thing, what a silly thing to inscribe on your, on your money, no more beyond. How foolish, dummies. But there are people 
Some of you may, you may be in this place right now, in this room. You may be in this place right now at home somewhere. There, there, there are lots of believers who are living with a nothing more inscribed on their heart somewhere. I've saved, I've received Jesus, I've been filled with the Holy Spirit, I, I've done this, I've done that, I went through growth track, I've done Sunday school, I've done the catechisms, I've done the isms and the tisms and the, all the other things there is, man, I've done the classes, I've read the books, man, I don't know. And this is, this is Paul discovered this same thing that the Spanish Empire discovered back in the 15th century when he writes Philippians 3.12. He says, and this is at the end of his life, after he's seen the miracles, after he's watched God birth churches all over the world. Paul says, I have still not obtained it. He says, I'm still becoming. I have not become everything that God has called me to be. And he said, I am living with the, with the more beyond attitude. I press on till my dying breath to reach that for which Christ has reached me. He realized Jesus grabbed a hold of my heart for a reason. He had something he wanted me to become. He had something he wanted to shape me into. And I am not yet fully that, so I've got to press on. I've got to strive. I've got to push. I've got to keep searching, keep praying, keep reading, keep being transformed. Because there is more beyond for me to discover. And I don't care how long you've been in church. I don't care if you've been. Listen, I've been in church my whole life. And I mean my whole life. And I know there's still more for me to discover. I've, <laughs> there's more for us, family, is what I'm trying to say. Amen. I'll just give you an example in my own personal life. And then I'm going to be done. Just, just for me. Just for me. Just this in the last in the last few weeks as I was looking at the new year and thinking about God, what, what do I need to do this year? What do you want me to what do you want me to become this year? That really is a question. I'm God, what do I want? To, that's the question I'm trying to ask and, 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 and really try to frame my answers these days. Who am I becoming? What I do will figure itself out. God, who do I want to who do you want me to become? You know who I've always, I've, I've, <laughs> this is no secret, I've talked about this a lot, I preached a whole series on it last year actually. I've always been a guy, you know that scene in Christmas Story when uh, the Ralphie's dad is fixing the, the heater and he's, he's going crazy, you know what I'm talking about? That's been me for so long. Like I can handle I mean, I can flip out and get upset, but it's like if it's a big thing, I can probably handle that sometimes better than the small things. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Like a, my kid could get arrested and I'd probably, I'd be upset. Obviously, I'd be upsetting, but I would figure that out, handle that calmly. But like, but like if they spill milk, I'm like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? Like that's a. And it's, yeah, we joke about it, and we laugh, and, and, we, and that's common for a lot of us, I'm sure. But I'm just like, man, you know, I read this scripture. And again, it comes back to the Word of God. There's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, you know what? It's the small foxes that spoil the vine. It's the small things that sometimes mess up the whole thing. I had to, I had to put a new faucet on my kitchen sink last Saturday. It should have took me an hour, and it took me all day. And I was just like Ralphie's dad, dude. I mean, I was mad. I'm serious. I almost, I literally almost, I literally almost ripped out my entire cabinet to my kitchen. I was so upset. I was, it was just, <laughs> I know none of y'all been there, right? I know. I'm holding my 275 pound frame up with one hand under the sink, trying to reach as high as I can and get the, and it was, it was literally an hour of me trying to get that last little washer and nut on the thing and it just wouldn't go. And I was losing my ever loving mind. I said a bunch of stuff I shouldn't have said at the top of my lungs. My neighbors were calling the police. No, they didn't call the police. 
But they probably got freaked out, honestly. And that's just, I'm just being honest with you. You know, I'm like, God, I don't want to be that person no more. Amen. I, I know, I don't want to sound, it may sound sad, it's like, I don't want to be that person that lets the small foxes jack up a whole thing. Amen, somebody? That's just something God's working in me. Justin, don't be that, don't be that person. Don't be the person that lets the small foxes spoil the vine in your life. more beyond is what I'm trying to say. There's more beyond for me. There's more beyond for you. Would we stand all over this place this morning? <clears throat> Would you just bow your heads for a second? Close your eyes just for a moment. And I'm like, we're not going to do a big long altar call. question. I'm just going to leave you with this question today and then we're going to pray. I want to challenge you to ask yourself this. This week, this, this year, and as you, every time we come into the house, every time you get into the Word of God, this is the question I'm going to, I want, I want, I want, I want to have this. I just really feel like the Lord wants to ingrain in our spirit. Who do I, as a child of God, want to become? Who am I becoming as a son or a daughter of God? Who does Jesus want me to become as a child of God? Holy Spirit, I ask you right now to put an unbelievable hunger and thirst for that question to be answered in every single one of our lives. Lord, I pray that you give us the faith and the courage to allow you to answer that question for us and nothing else. Don't let any other voice answer that question for us, only your voice. You can give your voice to other people, that's fine, but we don't want any other influences on the answer to that question except that, that come from you. In fact, right now in the name of Jesus, I ask you to free us in our mind, free us in our hearts, free us in our spirits from any other voice that's been trying to answer that question for us, maybe even for years, Father. I pray, God, if there's any areas in our lives, God, that need to have that question unanswered and unwrapped and unraveled, begin that way work, Holy Spirit, in each and every one of us, and let us hear you over the coming days, weeks, and rest of our lives, Lord, every day. Answer the question, who do you want us to become? In Jesus' name. And I pray, Father, you give us the spirit and the mindset and the faith of Paul to understand that no matter how many times and how many ways and how many places you've answered that question, there is more beyond. There is more for us to press into and discover and to become. And Father, I declare in the name of Jesus, we will hear you answer that question and we will become who you have called us to become and who you are shaping us into. We will see and we will reflect your glory in our lives, God, in Jesus' precious name. Do you receive that? Do you receive that work in your life this morning? Say amen. Come on, give him a big hand clap of praise. Come on. In fact, why don't you just in your own way, why don't you just in your own way as we dismiss today, if you need prayer, there'll be some prayer team guys up here that'll be willing to pray with you, man. And if you prayed that prayer earlier and gave your life to the Lord, please come check us out. Come get prayer. Come ask your questions, whatever you need. But I, I want you just, as we close, before you just run out the door, they're going to fire up a tune here in a second. Before you just run out the door, take a second, just take a second, and, and just make that prayer. I've prayed the prayer, and this is something I pray, I'm praying for you. Pray for yourself for a minute. God, God, who do, who do you want me to become? Lord, I want to become whatever that word wording is for you. Take a second and do that before you jump out of here. Amen. Stretch your hands this way. Receive this blessing from the Lord right now as we dismiss. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. The Lord establish you and the Lord give you his peace. Jesus, make us what you want us to become. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Yeah, no.